Thank you very much for joining us on this exciting second day of the Australian-German um, Energy Symposium. I'm Malte Meinshausen. I'm here um, the co-director of the Energy Transition Hub on the Australian side together with my colleague Frank Jotzo um, and together with my colleague Rebecca Burden, who is the general manager of the Energy Transition Hub um, here in Australia. I first would like to, yesterday we had a traditional owner of the land actually giving us an introduction. Um, it's customary for our German colleagues that um, we normally start events with uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. So um, I would hereby like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past and present. Um, we, I would also like to welcome you to the university here. Um, you are in the old quadrangle room, freshly renovated. Um, freshly renovated, as we heard yesterday, also with directly imported triple glazing from Germany. Um, however, before it was renovated, it already had other German connections. And yesterday you were introduced also to that small Mittelstand company Siemens that you might have heard of or not. Um, our Australian CEO here had actually lectures and studies right in these rooms, as I learned yesterday. So, Jeff, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so, good um, German uh, connections to this space. And uh, with the further introductions for today, I hand over to my colleague, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and, um, and welcome again um, to those who were here yesterday, and welcome for the first time to um, those who are joining us just for the day today. Um, although many of you from the uh, BDI and Architect delegation were here for the reception last night as well. Um, we'd like to start by thanking the, uh, the ministries involved in hosting this event. Um, today it's hosted by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia and the Ministry for Education and Research in Germany, BMBF, who is also funding the architect and BDI delegation to be here. Um, and it's been a wonderful collaboration. Yesterday was hosted by the Department of the Environment and Energy in Australia and the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy in Germany. Um, so it's another great example of Australian-German collaboration, um, which has been furthered by organizing this event together with Adelphi and AHK um, uh, in partnership with us, the Energy Transition Hub. Um, we uh, would also like to acknowledge that the Energy Transition Hub is a collaboration of 13 different institutes across Australia and Germany, seven in Australia and six in Germany, almost all of whom are here represented in some form or other. Um, so in Australia, as well as um, the University of Melbourne and ANU, we have um, Murdoch University, RMIT, the UTS, and Monash. Um, which is, um, and I think all of those are here today. And in Germany, we have um, the Potsdam Institute PIC, the MCC, the University of Munster, the Hertie School of Governance, and um, who am I? Yes, the German Aerospace Center, <laughs> DIW. Um, it's a long list. Um, so yesterday was focused on the power on the power system transition broadly. Um, and we started with an overview of the um, key issues in the power system transition and then had, um, which was a fantastic session, um, and then had a um, traversed flexibility options in all their many forms and uh, before talking about market design issues that are emerging in both Germany and Australia. Uh, and the final session focused on facilitating transitions and in particular those that are affecting the regions. Today is focused much more broadly on transition across the economy and um, it will highlight uh, issues across sectors with a particular focus on some of those complementary opportunities for Australia and Germany. Um, and of course, inside of that, there is quite a big focus on hydrogen, um, but we're also focusing in the last sessions on implications for energy intensive industries, um, which will be, I think, uh, um, very interesting as well. Uh, so without um, taking up any more of your time, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the speakers who are making opening remarks for us, um, starting with Cathy Raper, the first Assistant Secretary from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade.
Thank you very much, Rebecca, and uh, hello to everyone today. It's, uh, it's an honour to be here representing the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade at the symposium. Um, and we uh, thank the um, Australian Germany Energy Transition Hub for all the work that they've done to organise this today with the other partners, as mentioned. Now, I understand you had some really good, interesting, in-depth discussions yesterday and certainly looking forward to being a part of the symposium today and seeing uh, the conversations build upon those discussions. So from uh, DFAT's perspective, today's event is very much a reflection of the breadth and depth of the Australian-German relationship. So it, given my role is, um, is in charge of the overall relationships between Australia and our European partners, including Germany, I thought I'd just give you a few remarks that sought to put today's um, discussions into that broader context. So as the world becomes more complex, um, it's becoming more clear than ever that Australia and Germany need to work with like-minded partners to further and protect our, our interests in the world. And we very much see Germany as one of uh, Australia's leading like-minded partners. Um, it's very clear that we share um, key values, including a commitment to democracy, rule of law, multi multilateralism, and a commitment to the global rules, norms and institutions that have underpinned our prosperity and security over the last 70-something uh, years or so. Now those um, rules, norms and institutions are under increasing threat and so we're very keen to look at ways that we can work together. That starts from the very top. Our, our leaders do um, work together on the world stage to pursue our shared interests. Um, and in fact, um, just last month, um, Prime Minister Morrison and Chancellor Merkel met at the G7 summit in Biarritz to have a discussion around those themes. Um, like Rebecca, I just wanted to recognise the, the other ministries that are co-hosting this symposium. Um, so um, I recommended the German Ministry of Education and Research, which like, is that still working? Which like DFAT has provided significant funding to the uh, Australia-Germany uh, Energy Transition Hub. Um, we also have the uh, German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, um, who are represented here today, and uh, of course my colleagues from Australia's Department of Energy, sorry, Depart Australia's Department of Environment and Energy, who are going to be working with BMWI to host tomorrow's bilateral energy working group meeting. So while um, these good government-to-government -government relations are really important, there's also a, um, a really crucial trade and investment element to our relationship. And this is important uh, as well because it creates high quality jobs and business opportunities which really are the lifeblood of our communities. So Germany is Australia's 11th largest trading partner and we have a 23.3 billion two-way goods and services trade which is, uh, which is enormous. Um, interestingly, um, Australia um, is, uh, um, well, Germany is the sixth largest destination for Australian investment abroad. So we are actually bigger investors in Germany than Germany is in Australia. Um, with Australian investment in Germany now valued at 77.3 billion. And this year um, we um, instituted another piece of architecture in our relationship to continue to take this forward. That is our joint economic committee meeting, um, which met for the first time um, with uh, Minister Cormann in the lead for Australia and Minister Altmaier for Germany. Um, I think it was in June this year. And they were looking at ways to build on this already very strong commercial relationship. So this brought together government and business leaders to discuss contemporary issues in the global economy. Industry 4.0, energy transition, very relevant to our discussion today and international trade issues. I think, Jeff, you were a part of that uh, discussion, so thank you for your ongoing involvement in that. Um, we will also continue to look for how we can strengthen our trade and investment links through, through that forum. Um, another way that Australia and Germany are working together is that we have an innovation landing pad in Berlin, which is helping Australian startups and entrepreneurs access the world-class in-market business development, investment and mentorship opportunities in Germany and across Europe. Um, and that's already starting to deliver some really, uh, really important results. Um, Germany, of course, is an uh, important partner in its own right, but is also a member of the European Union, and Australian relations with the European Union are also going from strength to strength. We, of course, um, are engaged in negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU, who as a group is our second largest trading partner, third largest export market, and largest two-way investment partar So that FTA, FTA is, uh, negotiation is underway, is off to a good start, um, and we're, we're hopeful that we will see progress uh, there before too long. Um, we also have an um, EU-Australia framework agreement that was signed in 2017. And this is a, um, an agreement that brings together 
the broad cooperation right across the many sectors that make up the Australian-Germany relationship. So we talk about issues including security, counterterrorism, cyber, research and innovation, sustainable development, human rights and cultural issues. And this very much reflects a, a shared values and commitment to um, strengthening international rules and norms and global governance. Um, so um, there's no doubt that um, these activities will be reconnected to what we're talking about today. I mean, the FTA will definitely bring new opportunities in the energy transition world. And coming back to today's symposium, we're pleased to see that this brings together researchers, business and policymakers from Australia and Germany to look at ways that we can um, you know, look at the challenges that we're facing and the opportunities that we can work on together. And um, my experts tell me that Australia has some very strong um, uh, aspects, some expertise in these areas that we can bring to the, to the table, particularly around clean energy technologies, sustainable cities, climate smart infrastructure, water management, land-based carbon offsets and climate finance. Um, and I know that Germany likewise brings very clear smarts and technology to the table in many of those areas. Already in Australia we have 17,000 people or more employed in the renewable energy sector and we are, um, are rich in the minerals that are used in high technology and clean energy applications, such as battery storage and wind turbines. So with Australia's um, resources and um, German technology, we think there are some great opportunities to grow and diversify our exports and to deploy emerging technologies like hydrogen fuel, bioenergy and electric vehicles. Um, now, I understand that hydrogen will be a topic of the discussion today, and I'm very interested to, to hear more about the ideas and how we can, can work together from an overall relationship perspective. Um, we're both co-leaders, as I understand it, of the Mission Innovation Hydrogen Challenge, um, an international R&D collaboration involving 14 countries in the EU, so that will be important to, to hear the results from. Um, and I know today we'll be talking more about um, hydrogen R&D, energy transition issues related to that, regulation standards and certification. Um, now, just in closing, and I understand there was some discussion on this yesterday, but um, as a representative of the Australian Government, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to restate, restate Australia, Australia's position on climate change. Um, and that is just to underline Australia's commitment to the Paris Agreement and ambitious climate action. Um, I'm sure you all know that our Paris target is to reduce emissions by 26 to 28% by 2030 on 2005 levels, and we do see that as a significant contribution to global climate action. Um, it will represent a halving of emissions per person in Australia, or a two-thirds reduction in emissions per unit of GDP. And we have a suite of policies in place to make sure we meet our emissions reduction target, backed by strong investments such as our 3.5 billion climate solutions package that was announced in February. Um, and per capita, we have the highest investment in renewable energy in the world. Now, we're also coming from DFAT, an important part of our climate um, response is supporting our neighbours in the Pacific. So um, you will have seen that the Prime Minister announced a climate and oceans package to assist Pacific Island countries to strengthen climate and disaster resilience. And that includes um, 500 million over five years from 2020 to increase funding for climate and disaster resilience. And that's on top of earlier, earlier commitments that, um, that were made. We also have, very importantly, an infrastructure financing facility called the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific that will be supporting climate, climate and resilient, resilient infrastructure projects across the Pacific. Anyway, I'll stop there. Um, I'm uh, um, the least qualified person to talk about energy transition in the room, I think. So I'm really very, looking very much forward to hearing from the experts around the room today and to looking at ways that these discussions can further the already very rich and broad relationship between Australia and Germany and take it to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cathy. Um, and I would like to introduce now Professor Robert Schlergel, um, who's the co-lead of the Architect BD, BDI delegation together with Herr Lursch, which is another fantastic example of collaboration, this time between industry and research. Um, please. <coughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning here. Um, I can be very brief with my address because all important things have been said 
by the previous speakers. I'm, I'm sure that everybody in our delegation is here to reciprocate and resonate what has been said about the relations between Australia and, and Germany. And of course, there is a good reason why this delegation is here, because if you are a giant on this planet, then we sh you should also be visible from the other side of the globe. And uh, the sheer fact that we are here tells you, yes, you are visible. Um, I have to say that this delegation is just, this is a whole sequence of events, and it started three years ago. This delegation first visited the US, another giant, as you might recognize. And last year we visited the, um, the, um, the Asian countries, so we were in China, in Korea, and in Japan, maybe also giants. And in Japan, we learned a lot about the relations between Japan and uh, Australia, and that was one of the important reasons that prompted us to decide. Now we have to come to the real place and see how the giant looks here. Um, and the first three days of our delegation really were extremely successful, so we, we got essentially all the, the information that we wanted to, to gather, and also the plan with which we came to really strengthen our relations has now got some shape in the last two days, I would say. And in this way, we can also say this was a very successful meeting so far. And now we are happy to contribute a little bit to this symposium. Um, the sheer fact of our delegation is really to look not into power transition, but to look into hydrogen and, and synthetic fuel uh, element of this, because uh, when you look for the energy transition from the end, and you under we understand all that we want to remove fossil energy carriers completely out of the energy cycle, then we will certainly recognize that this is impossible without material energy carriers. There is some uh, room to increase the share between electricity and material energy carriers, and we can certainly debate how much that is, but we should not continue the debate that it is impossible to electrify the whole system. That is simply not possible. And when you do that, then of course you find that the first and most important intermediary that you find is hydrogen. And so nothing happens without hydrogen, and that is the reason why in our delegation now stands under this uh, say motto, we first link it to hydrogen and anything that comes after that. I'm looking forward to the discussion that we will have here. I'm also very well aware that Australia is not only a place with lots of sunshine, but this is also a place with eminent science, and this is very good that we are here and can also strengthen not only the institutional, but also the individual relationships between scientists, because after all, uh, personal relations between scientists is an important driver when you want to move things forward, and it is very obvious standing here and seeing this, this institution and seeing also this operation that would not have happened without uh, strong individual relations between scientists of both countries. So that is certainly also a very important factor that we have to stress. I dare to say that we have been very well supported also by the, not only by the uh, people from the German embassy here, but also by the Australian partners that we met, the, the, the typical friendliness and openness that we would have thought from Germany is a characteristic of Australia. We experienced very well here, and I dare to say maybe on behalf of all members of the delegation, thank you to all those people who gave us this, this hospitality and this openness that we could really discuss things clearly and openly, and that was very fruitful. In this spirit, I hope we can continue, and we will have a very interesting day, and I don't want to take away any more time from the real discussion, and for this, I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schlegel. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Professor Michael Cardio hall who's the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Innovation at ANU, which is the um, co-leads the energy transition hub here in Australia together with the University of Melbourne. Good morning. Uh, I'd firstly like to acknowledge traditional custodians of the land on whose land we meet today, um, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, first of all, I have to give some apologies from my Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt. Um, today coincided with us launching our grand challenge, Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific at Parliament House with the uh, Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions this morning. Um, otherwise, he would have been here. Um, but that is to signify that we've invested a considerable amount of money in the very topic that you're discussing here. I think it shows that this is a very hot topic and, uh, and we're very committed to it. Um, 
What it also means is because he's not here, um, I'm in his stead. Um, so you won't get the wise wisdom of a Nobel Prize winner. You're going to have to put up with me for the time being. But I do have his notes, so I'll share those with you. Um, as, a national, as the National University, the ANU is committed to really engaging in the big research questions that face the nation and the world. Um, that was the primary reason the university was established in 1946, is to really do that post-war reconstruction. And it's still relevant today in terms of what our mission is, um, as is, I think, Melbourne University and every other university in the country. And the grand challenges we've, in, we've been investing in, that I've just mentioned, we have another uh, three that we're investing in as well. Um, they're generally not alone in terms of uh, Australia being facing those grand challenges. Um, and what we've recognised is that whilst we can uh, invest in them ourselves, we really need to undertake collaborative research uh, internationally to bring teams together to really address them because they are global challenges. And how future energy needs are met is a challenge for all countries. Um, how we transition from one energy economy to another question that we need, all need to answer. At the ANU, we see the energy transition up as an ex excellent example of how university research can inform governments and support new, industry in, 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 new initiatives by industry. Um, and in fact, that means what, that what we're showing and what for us is, is how we can show impact of the research that we undertake. Um, and a successful collaboration between universities funded by government, DFAT and the universities. And <clears throat> it shows the value of Australia's research-based collaboration with Germany um, going forward. The two countries face very similar challenges and opportunities in the change in, in the energy systems, whether they're driven by policy or technology or a combination of both. Evident from the discussions about the electricity system in both countries, it's obvious that the insights from research in both countries can inform better practice in both countries. Now today I'm sure we hear about the economy-wide and long-term perspectives on energy uh, and what we need to do to bring about our sustainability into the future. Um, I've already mentioned ANU is investing heavily in research and future opportunities for Australia to be a large producer of export of renewable energy. Historically, we've invested heavily and researched into photovoltaics, solar thermal, and now we're moving into the next range, which is really focusing on hydrogen, the hydrogen economy, and how we can build hydrogen export industry for Australia. And, and we need to understand how Australia can secure its role in that export industry as we move towards that zero carbon emission in the decades to come. This vision is really in line with Germany's interest, and in particular from what I heard yesterday, very much so, as a possible importer of zero carbon energy, and as a likely exporter of technology, <coughs> and Germany is a likely um, exporter of technology to make zero carbon fuels. Uh, this collaboration around technology, um, I think, is not new. Uh, what I heard yesterday is that if you go around any of our power stations, if you go through the Snowy Hydro scheme, you will see German technology there. Uh, and I think that um, relationship needs to continue into the future because I think we can support each other in, in making ourselves sustainable in our energy futures. <clears throat> the energy transition is a good example of, of, of how we might do that. The initiative, my understanding, was born out of a government convened bilateral group of which the ANU's Vice Chancellor Brian Schmidt was involved. And I succinctly recall him going to Germany with the then with, with, with the Minister. Matthias Cormann uh, at the time to work out what that might look like. And out of that, the hub became a reality when the VCs of both the ANU and the University of Melbourne together with our academics and the very support of, of, of both government, it, it came about. Uh, and it was announced by the then Minister um, Malcolm Turnbull and Chancellor Merkel at, on the margins of a G20 ham meeting in Hamburg. Um, and I think that was the start of what this focus should be. Um, but that's nothing new. There is enormous potential for bilateral research and collaboration between the two countries. Um, but this is not based upon just doing something from nothing. Um, the ANU, for instance, does a lot of collaboration with Germany, research collaboration with Germany already. Um, in terms of co-publications, Germany ranks third in the countries that we uh, co-publish with. Um, <clears throat> and that puts it ahead of China uh, by some margin as well. Um, just on a personal note as well, um, my son is actually doing a collaborative projects with DLR and is spending time at Stuttgart University uh, as we speak. Um, and so I think you know, we're not building from a zero base. Um, what we can build upon is what is a very strong research collaboration across many different disciplines already. Um, and so from that, I think we can grow. Um, 
yesterday I came along to the reception yesterday evening. Um, it was quite clear there's a massive buzz in the room. It's quite clear there's a real enthusiasm to really work on this. Um, what I also know is that being in Canberra, we're very close to the embassy and we work very closely with the embassy. And so there are many dimensions of which the university can help push this forward. I'm sure your deliberations today will actually come up with some really good ideas. And uh, the university is very, very supportive on how we can take the activities of the transition hub forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I know this is always the most exciting part of the day, but I have a few housekeeping matters that we should run through quickly, and I'll try to be very quick. Um, one thing I did want to note is um, when we're talking about collaboration, it, the registrations we have for this event really do reflect not just the German-Australian, but also the industry, research, and government coming together. We have roughly equal proportions from all of those different areas of the um, of society, um, together with a smaller number of um, civil society groups, and that is fantastic to see. Clearly, all are going to be very, very important in driving the energy transition. So, very quickly, housekeeping: um, there is Wi-Fi available here. Uh, you can all access that by choosing the visitor when the wi on the Wi-Fi options that come up. Uh, the passwords are on the and the, um, the username is Energy Symposium, and the password is shown on the holding slide, um, which is quite hard to see, so I'll just read it. It's three, at symbol, lowercase os, uppercase ph. Um, we also have a Twitter handle, and if you would like to be tweeting, uh, that is also shown on the holding slide. But the handle is hashtag AU, capital AU, underscore, capital DE, underscore, energy 2019. Toilets are also very important. They are downstairs um, at, on the ground floor. The emergency procedures, similarly, just please exit. If there is any emergency, please exit via the stairs and um, the staff around will, will assist. Uh, another important thing to note is um, it, through all of this collaboration, there are very strong similarities that emerge and some differences. Uh, the Australians will tend to refer to people by their first name. It comes with all of the best intentions. I realise that um, in Germany that may not be quite so common, but please do not take offence in the event that people um, salute you with your first name. Um, and one other thing to note, we released, the Energy Transition Hub released some summaries of the research that we've been undertaking over the last couple of years through this initiative, and um, they, are la they are around. Um, please feel free to take copies. They're also available on um, download. I should have had, oh, there, my, um, my assistant, <laughs> Alter, is holding these up so you can see. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chloe Munro, Professor Chloe Munro, who is going to moderate the first session of the day. Um, Chloe is the chair of the Strategic Advisory Board of the Energy Transition Hub, among, among many other roles that she fills in, um, in this space. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, uh, um, Rebecca. And, and I might just call my fellow panelists up to the uh, uh, the platform to take their seats. Uh, we've been assigned seats according to the microphones, so um, please do join me. Uh, we've just heard in the introductory remarks, I think that probably the, the key word there was collaboration, and uh, Rebecca talked about um, the partnership between uh, industry, uh, research, research, and government, and this is fundamentally what this panel session is about. And we, we're really talking about the, tran the energy transition, which is so vital uh, for, uh, from the perspective of uh, avoiding the risk of dangerous climate change. So we have no option but to do this. Uh, it's also a vital economic transition. And the only way that this is going to work for us is if we're successful on both fronts. This has to be successful for uh, our economies across the world as much as it has to be successful for the climate. There's no option on either front. That There's not a trade-off. They have to be uh, moved forward in lockstep. And so I really think that that is what um, this panel discussion is about. Now, I see we don't yet have our um, Australian speaker representing industry, but I'm sure that uh, he will join us. 
shortly. <laughs> He's flying in, so you never know. Uh, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll start anyway. So in terms of this, this um, I want to introduce each, each speaker as they make their opening remarks, and then we'll, we'll move to a Q&A session. So please do be thinking of your questions as you listen to the panelists with their opening contributions and uh, be ready to bring them forward in, in the closing session. We won't have questions after each one. Um, but when I think about industry, research, government, there is no one person who has traversed those three areas in Australia better, I think, than, than our first speaker, uh, Professor Ross Garno, who um, is extraordinary, has been extraordinarily eminent in all three fields, and I, I think his, his ability to traverse those um, as a diplomat, as, as an advisor to governments on some very crucial issues, and I worked on the outcome of um, one of the major pieces of work that he did for Australian governments, uh, and of course um, is, um, is a prolific author, an economist, and has some very, some very important roles across industry. So I think to have a person who represents that uh, collaboration, we couldn't start better than with Professor Garner. So Ross, uh, let's hear from you. I think you're going to speak from your seat. You don't have slides, do you? No, fantastic. Uh, thanks, uh, Chloe. I'm very good to be here. Uh, very good to see this gathering come together so strongly. Uh, the the German-Australian collaboration is potentially uh, one of the most important elements in the world getting its act together uh, on the climate and energy transition. It's already been very important. Uh, uh, the the photovoltaic uh, revolution. Uh, that we've, we're going through now, and which is uh, lowering the cost of zero emissions energy, is a marvellous uh, success story of globalisation with our two countries playing a part in it. Um, I, I'll just mention the main, what I see as the main elements of that uh, for a moment because it exemplifies the collaboration. I, I think a lot of it, a lot of the story began with the uh, uh, German policies on uh, promoting uh, uh, photovoltaics through uh, uh, feed-in tariffs and other ways early in the century. Uh, the second part of the story is that Australia is the main centre in the country in the world for training uh, clever young Chinese in electrical engineering. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of their graduates from, uh, uh, from the two universities that are at the centre of the hub, ANU and Melbourne, and uh, even more so, I must confess, uh, the University of New South Wales. Uh, uh, graduates in electrical engineering went back to China, started up uh, enterprises to use the, uh, what they'd learned uh, at Australian universities, saw the market in Europe and Germany for photovoltaics and uh, hugely expanded the scale of production, reduced the costs, and we've got and a lot of the falls in, uh, uh, in uh, costs of uh, uh, solar, solar uh, photovoltaic power uh, is, is a result of that collaboration. Similar story in wind with uh, Australia not playing such a central part, but Germany playing um, a very important part. And I think that's going to be a very important uh, part of the next stage of, uh, uh, of the transition where we move into zero emissions uh, energy. It's going to be uh, German companies, not only German, but especially German companies um, with uh, uh, applied technology, <coughs> uh, low cost, uh, uh, high quality uh, capital goods uh, for, uh, uh, for, for hydrogen, for uh, uh, using uh, um, uh, hydrogen to, uh, to, to smelt metals, uh, uh, other areas of uh, chemical engineering that uh, um, that, that brings the technology to uh, Australia to use our incomparable resources and then trade between Europe and Australia can be an important part of the story. Just a few words on um, where Australia is, uh, where, the, uh, the, where, where the, the land of uh, exotic uh, uh, animals and, uh, uh, and biota generally, where, where the land of... Uh, exotic uh, policy debates uh, <laughs> uh, where, uh, uh, where, where, uh, where the country, where the developed country with by far the strongest interest uh, in 
the climate transition because we're the most vulnerable to unmitigated climate change and, and we're the country that's, that's been most uh, confused and internally contradictory in our approach to the question. And we're the country, the developed country with the richest per capita endowment of fossil energy, uh, the world's biggest export of coal and now of uh, natural gas and the developed country with the world's best endowment of zero emissions uh, uh, energy. So uh, uh, we've had to sort through all of these things and uh, a lot of the policy uh, confusion in Australia the debates, uh, uh, the chopping and changing uh, uh, is, is, is the, uh, uh, the, the, the coming together of, uh, uh, of these different uh, opportunities. We're heavily invested in the uh, fossil energy e economy uh, uh, coal, if you take metallurgical and uh, thermal coal together, is uh, with iron ore our biggest export, just ahead of uh, the products of our university and uh, universities and educating uh, overseas students. Um, uh, we, we became the world's biggest exporter of aluminium uh, in the 80s when Japan started to take uh, environmental problems seriously and shifted within a decade from being the, 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 the Western world's largest producer of aluminium to the the largest importer that industry shifted into the coal fields of, a, of Australia, uh, in Queensland, New South Wales, and uh, uh, and Victoria. So we've got very well established big industries uh, dependent on uh, uh, fossil energy, but we've got huge opportunities in the zero carbon uh, uh, um, uh, future of the world. Uh, the um, the, the fu the industries and the people uh, of the future don't get to vote in current elections. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one of our big challenges is how to bring the issues of the future to account uh, in the current uh, uh, debates about, uh, about policy. And I think that's a special role of the, uh, the, the hub to, uh, uh, to inform the, uh, the, the community on the opportunities of the future so that so that the, the people of the future uh, uh, get a vote, at least in the, uh, by being taken into account uh, um, in, in the decisions of people voting now. Uh, to, to, to conclude, just on a couple of the very big opportunities, there's a lot of mention of hydrogen yesterday and today, and uh, uh, one, one day uh, there, there may be uh, large-scale uh, trade in um, liquefied uh, hydrogen, but uh, uh, the, it seems to me that the most obvious uh, uh, first step uh, is to uh, use uh, renewable energy and hydrogen uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to smelt Australian uh, 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 minerals, where by far the world's largest exporter of uh, metal oxides uh, uh, 40% of the world's production of uh, iron oxide, 60% uh, of the world's exports of iron oxide, uh, if we're also the place where hydrogen is, uh, can be manufactured most cheaply, uh, then, then the world's low cost path to uh, zero emission steel uh, is uh, to use German equipment and technology and, and co companies to uh, be part of a process of smelting iron oxide in Australia and base European industry on, uh, uh, on later stage uh, processing of minerals. But uh, we've got a very similar story and a very wide range of uh, minerals uh, exported from Australia and the economics of that uh, will, will look strong uh, bef before the, uh, uh, the, the economics of uh, liquefied hydrogen exports uh, uh, look strong. I, I think this is uh, a transformational opportunity for both of our countries. 7% uh, seven, of uh, the world's emissions, total emissions, are just from the, uh, uh, the, the reduction of iron oxide into iron metal. Uh, so uh, there's a big prize in climate for, uh, for, for getting that right. And uh, one that's not much of a feature of the discussion yesterday and today, but a very important one, uh, uh, an issue that's not thought about as much in Europe, but one where our science can, uh, can help a fair bit, I think. Uh, there's been more attention recently uh, to 
uh, what's come to be called natural climate solutions um, with the major study of the US uh, Academy, National Academy of Science uh, concluding that about about 30% or 37% of the potential or uh, well, what is necessary uh, in terms of uh, reduction of uh, carbon going into the atmosphere uh, as part of a 1.5 degree strategy can come from natural climate solutions. Uh, uh, there's immense opportunity for that in, in Australia. Uh, and uh, Australian uh, science in areas of agriculture, uh, forestry, land use uh, is, is one of our uh, our classical strengths, uh, and uh, 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 Europe has tended to be sceptical about uh, uh, the, uh, the, poten the potential for uh, uh, sequestration in, uh, uh, in the biosphere and in, uh, the, the, in the Earth's uh, crust uh, via the biosphere, uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, this is an area in which working together uh, we, we can come up with better international policies that make use of what is a very large opportunity. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Ross, for those comments, and, and I think it certainly paints the picture of the opportunity for Australia. I, I, I was struck by your, your comment on natural climate solutions, which is one of the many things I've been involved in <laughs> parts of my career, is that um, Australia, we, we have an expression which is prime agricultural land, and we talk a lot about protecting prime agricultural land. But the fact is, most of the agricultural land in Australia is seriously subprime, and it's really uh, very low productivity per hectare. And its opportunity to participate in the carbon economy is actually massive, and, and we are very long on land that has this you know, current lo low productivity, but if you can in incorporate those natural solutions with the economic and the climate solution, it, it, it's a fantastic opportunity for Australia. So I'm glad you mentioned it, um, Ross. Um, so now um, I'll, I'll hand over to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Philip Mathis. So, so I, I think you heard from Do Dr. Mathis yesterday. Um, he is, um, and will bring, bring us the German perspective, so the counterparts to what we, we, we've, we, we've heard from, from Ross. And um, so he's, he's the research coordinator for energy and climate uh, policy at the um, Erko Institute. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, the Institute for Applied Ecology. Uh, so I think that also, uh, obviously, there's a connection with what we just spoke about, the, 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 the ecological solutions to climate change. So I'm very interested to hear your introductory remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. Uh, as a good Prussian Protestant, the first question always is, what is the purpose of your presentation? <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of my presentation is to provide you some insights where I see the need, underscore the need, for additional, underscore additional cooperation uh, between Germany and Australia. And I have three starting points. Uh, before I come to some conclusions. These three starting points are, what is my observation where energy transformation, and I don't like this term of energy transition, uh, it, it is a transformation, where energy transformation in Germany stands at the moment. The second starting point is, what are the recent, the most recent lessons learned from the interface between number crunching and policies slash politics, and there is a difference between policies and the politics uh, with regard uh, to energy transformation. Uh, and the third starting point are yesterday's discussions. Uh, and I tried to combine these uh, then in my last slide into some thoughts where I think that additional cooperation might worth uh, to be considered. The first is uh, Germany uh, is uh, on a bumpy road of energy transformation and if you think about where we need cooperation, it is worth highlighting uh, what are the imbalances uh, in strategic, in terms of strategies of the energy transformation. 
And I think really if you have a careful look on what happened uh, during the last, let's say 30 years when we had the first climate policy program, then we have essentially five different strategies and elements where we see uh, progress and where we see significant deficits. The first, the traditional strength of German energy and policy, uh, energy and climate policy is uh, paving the way for the clean options. We had significant progress with regard to the renewables, at least in the power sector, too, with regard to energy efficiency, with regard to circular economy, etc., etc. So there, there we, we, we progressed uh, pretty well. However, the second strategy, uh, which is indispensable if you go for a transformation within the three or four decades, is that German policies have ignored notoriously the need for designing the exit game for the high carbon assets. So we have made some progress with the coal commission, but this is not the end of the story. If, if we have a look to the inertia of the system, there is a need to uh, design this exit game actively. And this is not, as, this is not an exclusive German issue. Uh, this is also certainly an issue where we need uh, to think about cooperation. The third, where the experiences are mixed, is triggering the infrastructure adjustments sufficient, with sufficient D times. We have yesterday discussed the electricity networks, but again, this is not the end of the story. If we really think about defossilization, uh, we need to think about the gas infrastructure. And this is about hydrogen ready. This is not a technical issue, it's a regulatory issue. And Jochen Hohmann uh, will, be, will be facing the issue of uh, bringing hydrogen ready investments in the gas infrastructure into the asset base. This is a key issue if you have a look on the depreciation periods of, of, of these gas network investments. It is also an issue for heat networks. Making innovation work in time is one of the confusing uh, uh, German issues. Uh, if you go to German energy conferences, you are overwhelmed with, 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 with useful or crazy innovation proposals. The problem we have is that we are not attributing this innovation to phases. We are often mixing uh, the things which can be done and must be done tomorrow with the things which are needed for 2030 onwards. Uh, and and facing, facing the innovation approaches is an important. And one of the weaknesses of the German debate, and we will see, all, we, we will see also this tomorrow in the, in the governance proposal, that we need to make learning cross-border integration and phase-oriented approaches as an integral part of the policy mix. This is not the strength of Germany. We are, we, we are self-sufficient uh, in politics very often. This is, this, is the, this is the status quo. What do we know about the future energy system? And I think this is an, this is an interesting issue. We, uh, for, for the next decade, it's all about implementation. And we can exchange experiences. Uh, implementation is a highly technical issue, but this is manageable. The, the, the more, the more uh, demanding task is to think beyond the next decades. Uh, we have more uncertainties, uh, and we have uncertainties. The key question is, what is the answer? Waiting for something or designing policies which reflect at the fact that we don't know what, if, what the technologies in detail in 2050 will be, but the good news is we can describe these technologies structurally. Coordination intensive, that means markets will play a major role. Capital intensive, that means financing market design is a key issue. Infrastructure intensive, that means there need to be decisions on pathways. Sometimes, not tomorrow, but within the next decade. And uh, that, we meet, uh, that we need to reflect fundamentally change spatial patterns. This is a, this is a huge, this is, this is a huge characteristics of the new, of the new uh, things. That we learned from many modeling experiments. And if you know, bring these modeling experiments and the number crunching into the context with the uh, political decisions uh, in the recent years and months, then I would highlight three major issues. The new paradigm is climate neutrality. This is what the German government will declare tomorrow, what the Commission President-elect has declared for the European Union. And this is a fundamental change compared to the old targets. Because in the world of the 80% greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, it was essentially all about energy efficiency and electrification. 
This will be still important, but not sufficient. And that means we need to think about other carbon neutral fuels that will need to play a significant role. And almost all of these carbon neutral fuels will somehow be based on hydrogen. And this is a technical issue, this is an economic issue, this is a regulatory issue. I will come back uh, to this later. And if you look to the models, uh, uh, and there's a surprising, surprisingly uh, uh, consistent convergence. For the European Union, for 2050, we will see a demand between 100 and 150 million tons of oil equivalent of hydrogen or hydrogen-based novel fuels, what, how, how, however you call this. So this is significant. In 2030, the, mo the most models see 10 million tons of oil equivalent. This is the one truth. The other truth is that we discovered during the last months and years that land availability for energy system emerges as one of the most significant constraints in Germany. That means we will not be able to produce more than 800 terawatt hours of electricity based on renewables in Germany. That means there is nothing, nothing left for hydrogen production beyond some hydrogen for balancing the electricity system. That means we talk about imports. And that means, and this situation is, is almost the same for the European Union. That means we talk about imports of 100 to 150 million tons of oil equivalent into the European Union, which somehow have to do with hydrogen. We will discuss what does hydrogen need to be. And the third new, uh, new policy mechanism at the horizon is that if you read carefully the mission letters, the president-elect of the European Commission uh, uh, wrote to the designated commissioners in four of these mission letters, she highlights the term of border adjustments, border tax adjustments. If you would have asked me f three years ago if ever, ever, ever a European Union Commission president would propose carbon border tax adjustment, never, never, never. I said this is the typical economics rubbish textbook style, will never happen, will never happen. Uh, and, and now, we have it in four, in four mission letters. And this has consequences. This has consequences for, 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 for the policies, especially if it comes to the energy intensive industry. What does that mean in terms of my lessons learned from yesterday? The first major issue, and the, that was the surprising lesson learned yesterday, uh, that uh, Australia is probably a front runner of the integration uh, or to deal with changing spatial patterns and an increased role of distributed options for, general, for generation flexibility storage and high renewable systems because it's much less integrated, uh, so the, the, the network is weaker, and there, there, there's a huge, huge field for cooperation because in Australia many of the challenges we will face also in Europe will arrive earlier. And so practical evidence on this is, is, in, is important. I don't like the term of sector coupling, but sector integration is here, is, is also in, in this world. Uh, probably Australia will be, will be, will be a front runner. Second is innovative solutions for climate neutral heavy industries in the world of border tax adjustments. Interesting field, electrification, CCS, hydrogen, and others. And the third is towards a global hydrogen market because either hydrogen will play no role in this energy transformation or it will come from a global market. And that has a couple of implications. The first implication is that we, have, that we need to have a debate what are the technology chains for the green, the blue, the pink, the black hydrogen in technological terms, but more important, it is about the 40 euro per megawatt hour benchmark for the hydrogen. This is the benchmark for blue hydrogen if you are optimistic. And this is the benchmark we need to reach for the green hydrogen if this shall play a role. And even 
the 40 euro per, per megawatt hour benchmark, this is an equivalent if you take into account the 20 euro per megawatt hour natural gas price, this is an 100 euro per ton of CO2 carbon price tech. But this is the benchmark we need to talk about because sources which don't need the 40 euro benchmarks won't be successful in this market. The second is the governance framework to ensure climate neutrality. We have a precursor. We had the biomass debate, which totally failed because the lack of a global governance framework for which guaranteed the climate neutrality and the sustainability. And we can face the same situation for the hydrogen. And if we go to a market without having a reliable and accountable governance framework which ensures climate neutrality, the global hydrogen market can fail and with a failure of the global hydrogen market, energy transformation will fail. This is an important one. The third, the third issue is ramping up new markets is always a challenge in terms of competition and other terms. And what my recommendation for our cooperation were that we should have a fresh look to the energy charter, which was established in 1990 with a view to oil and gas and with a view uh, to Eastern Europe to establish a comparable framework which ensures investment, etc., etc., for the novel fuels. And I think we should have a fresh look on the energy car charter and maybe to set up an energy charter for the novel fuels. I have two issues where I have major questions after yesterday's debate. The first is, I think we have a need to debate enlightened policy mixes. Uh, uh, this is important, face-oriented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But given the fact that at least at the uh, at, at the theoretical level, uh, carbon pricing plays a major role in Europe, and carbon pricing here is a more toxic word. Uh, I, I don't know what what the future what the future of this debate might be. Uh, we need to dig into into some more details. And the, the last question mark is about just transition. Just, just transition is the new buzzword. Uh, it's important, uh, but we need to have a look on the different social contracts and we have a look to the different uh, conditions. And uh, what we discuss in Europe uh, on, about just transition is for 60% not about the energy dimension of this transformation. It is about bridging the divide between the rural areas and the booming areas which has nothing to do with energy, but it is applied in the field of energy. And, and, and I'm not entirely sure if, if the experiences we have here uh, in Europe uh, hold very much uh, for the Australian conditions. That means we need to dig into some detail if this is really, uh, if, if this is really a, a, a field where we need, uh, need cooperation and where we can add, uh, create added value uh, from this cooperation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Mathis, for that uh, presentation. And I, I think between yourself and Professor Garneau, we, there, was, there was a great linkage of where the mutual interest between Australia and Germany lies in uh, this uh, transformation uh, that you discuss. And you've also uh, laid out some um, <clears throat> you know, issues that we might, might come back to in the later conversation. I particularly like the expression, um, enlightened policy mixes. Uh, some of us in this room would say, if only. Uh, but um, meanwhile, um, whatever the policy framework, uh, the fact is that this, this, this transformation that is underway um, in the energy economy and that, that therefore flows through uh, the whole economy is to a very large extent going to be led by industry. It's industry that makes the investments, that actually does the practical execution of uh, the technological transformation that we're, that we're seeing, and it's industry that's directly engaged with, with, with the civil society and all of us as, 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 as consumers that really plays that core role uh, in, in, in the, um, the agenda that we're, we're talking about today. Um, so with that, I'm extremely pleased to have um, uh, a very senior representative of, of um, German industry 
uh, joining us. So, um, um, Holger Lush, who um, is the, um, let me get this right, the Deputy Director General and a member of the Executive Board of the uh, Federation of German Industries. And uh, very much welcome you to, I think you'll speak from your chair, to uh, give us your perspective and the, and the perspective that comes from uh, the Federation of German Industry. Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, you don't need exotic animals to have exotic energy debates. <laughs> it would be nicer with, but we don't have them, but we have the debates. So, well, I want to make a few remarks on where we are in Germany, um, what our prospects and challenges are, and a third point, what possibly collaboration between Australia and, and Germany on this field uh, could look like. As you all know, Germany is very ambitious on climate protection. So we're going to have, so everybody alludes to this. So in Berlin, everybody, everybody doesn't sleep and is uh, trying to set up a, a decision which is awaited like the arrival of the Ten Commandments. And uh, so we're going to see on Friday night, so we all have the choice to skip the flight back or fly back, whatever comes out of this uh, decision. No, but to be serious, uh, Germany is very ambitious. Uh, we, we, are, we have the most ambitious NDC um, inside the EU, and we have uh, set ourselves targets for 2050, between 80 and 95 percent reduction of CO2 compared to 1990. That's for a highly industrialized country, a really ambitious target. And um, so we have m made quite some progress, especially in the areas of energy and industry, because energy and industry have been under the regime of the European Emission Trade Scheme uh, since many years. And there we see, uh, I would say, about uh, more than a third of reduction compared to 1990. On the other hand, um, we as BDI did a very, um, a very ambitious uh, study together with our membership because we wanted to know from the heart of industry, so where do you think we go, where do you think we have to go, and where do you think we could go without killing ourselves. So that's of course something industry is always asking, so we want to reach the targets alive. And what came out there, and which, what is very much in line with findings of other studies, some of the study makers are in the room as well, was that if we go on with the ambition of policy we have today, which is not low, we end up uh, at 61% reduction in, in 2050. I think that's about common sense now in Germany. This would be the path we would end up uh, if we go on like this. So this is a far shot from 80 to 95, and this is an even further shot from carbon neutrality by 2050. So we um, looked at possible pathways, uh, how we could reach these targets. And I, I will just say a few words about that. What we came up with, and this was probably surprising for some of our members as well, was that with some cleverness, and I take up another word I liked, uh, uh, enlightened policy mixes, um, and, and uh, really commitment by industry, we could uh, envision to, to do 80% uh, with nationally, just, on a na just nationally, without any, any uh, macroeconomic uh, damage and uh, with existing technologies. If it comes to 95, uh, we thought, first of all, we would need some more technologies. We would need uh, some, a lot more innovation. And, and that's the critical thing, we probably would need a much more global uh, understanding of ambition. Uh, because as you all know, the German industry is, is in, in, in high competition with, on many fields with many other countries, especially in the G20. And so my saying is always industry hasn't, doesn't have a price problem. It has a problem with prices our competitors don't pay. And uh, so uh, this is uh, what, what we coin carbon leakage protection. And I think uh, governments will provide this to a certain degree. They do this today for the, the industries in heavy competition. But 
you cannot buy yourself out of carbon leakage danger all the way. This is not going to work. So we will really, this is for me most important, we will need to have this more global ambition. And we think that the G20 uh, are the, the right place to go. So I know there are some G20 members which thinking about the next host. Uh, it's a, a country which has a lot of oil and is situated in Arabia. Um, so there are some, some critical partners, but if the G20 don't get to grips with some sort of a common understanding of the challenge and of the need to have comparable or linkable systems of carbon pricing or of, uh, of um, well, effort, I, I don't think we will really get a good, solution, or a good outcome for all of this. So what is happening in Germany right now? Germany um, has decided to exit two major energy sources. The first is the nuclear. Uh, this is a, has been a very special German uh, society debate over decades. Uh, Fukushima was then, yeah, how do you say, so it was the hook to take it and, and finish it. So in 2022, we are out of nuclear, which is still about 10% of our base load. Uh, second thing, and some of Felix Mattes, Stefan Kapferer and others, so we, we, we all were part of this coal commission thing. Uh, the second was coal. And uh, so we will be out of coal by 2038 and we will lower the amount of coal in the system, in the energy system, considerably already until 23 and 2030. So we're gonna lose a, a, a great lot of um, um, security of supply. Uh, some say this is not a problem, we're going to make it. I would say you could doubt it and we'll see it. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a very ambitious decision, and, uh, but we took it as a society and we took it after long debates all together. So we have to stick to it, but all of us have to stick to it. So what this means is we have to see where energy and where reduction of CO2 can come from in the, in the industrial sector. And there, of course, you have the steel, uh, you have the concrete, the cement, you have uh, um, um, uh, all sorts of metals and the chemical industry, which are all very big in Germany. And, and this is for us as an industry federation, probably the biggest challenge, and uh, Felix Mattes alluded to it, how do we get these high carbon assets down on carbon, but not down on market share or profitability or competitiveness? And um, there I come to, to my last point. I think we had all too long a, a debate in Germany that all electric would be an option for the future. And this was utterly wrong. It's not an option. And uh, if you look at uh, mobility, so 98% of all fuels used in mobility are liquid or gas. So thinking that you could um, substitute all this with, with electricity uh, it was not a very wise idea. I've seen, and to my joy over the last months and year, uh, a global, um, a global um, commitment to look add alternatives to gas and liquids without CO2 emission. And this would be, in my, opinion, in my opinion, this is where Germany and Australia would really have a, a, a common interest. Uh, so we share common values, democracy, more Western system. Uh, we are both highly industrialized countries and uh, we are very strong in, in technology and we are to be honest, in strong need to alternative fuels for mobility and especially for industry processes uh, um, uh, as steel and others. And there I, I think these two countries really should look at what could be possible between us. And this is the, the purpose of our visit here. So we had many interesting talks over the last few days. And sometimes I thought, oh, 
the Australians are, are really scared, so now the Germans come and don't only want to sell technology, but they want to be a customer from us on hydrogen. So we have to sort this out. <laughs> but but we, we, we really should look down this path because these countries fit together very well. Um, uh, we share all these common values. We are strong on technology. We are strong on science. And uh, so I think this, this is an interesting option and an interesting vision, and uh, this is why we are here with this delegation from Architect and BDI, funded by the Education and Research Ministry, and uh, we will bring all we took in, as will the other delegation do, and the, uh, the Ministry of the Economy, and I think we, we need a debate back in Germany how we will follow up on this possible option of a cooperation, and uh, I hope we can the Australian side is doing the same thing. So we are running out of time a little bit, but not yet uh, too dramatically. But this would be my wish that from this week we could start something interesting over the next few years. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much. And I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> So I, I, I think um, you, you've painted very well some of the challenges that industry faces because you can't see how to get from the 80% potential to the neutrality uh, uh, that um, Felix Mathis was talking about. <clears throat> but you can also see the value of um, the collaboration we're here talking to, and I'm so pleased that you've had the opportunity to uh, meet some other people in, in, in the time that you're spending in Australia that, that, that will hopefully build some future relationships. Uh, now, clearly, um, Ines Willis hasn't been able <laughs> to join us. Uh, who, know, who knows where he is? But um, I do know roughly what he would have said. <laughs> and um, there are a couple of points which actually uh, echo very nicely what you say, so I'll just make a couple of them. Um, first of all, an enormous preoccupation with an energy prices here in Australia. Uh, and I think, as you're all aware, um, Industry uh, and indeed uh, domestic consumers have been rocked by the pace of increase in, in uh, end user prices for energy here, uh, where we've come off a, a legacy of um, energy being such a low cost input that people didn't really bother to manage it. Uh, so this, this, has been, this has been a huge thing and still is, and he would have talked about that and a bit about the, um, the outlook, but he would also have talked about um, the challenges that, that, that our electricity system is facing because of the integration of um, you know, an increasing proportion of renewables and other factors. That's not the only driver by all means, but it's the ever-present. I think um, Felix talked about us as, as a forerunner on those issues. It doesn't mean to say we really know how to do it well. And in fact, um, when Holger mentioned um, the, the policy stance of the, of the German government uh, moving out of nuclear, uh, we've actually just got another parliamentary inquiry uh, starting about whether we should be uh, preparing the pathway to go into nu nu nuclear power in Australia. It'll be interesting to see where that ends up. Um, but also with coal, so we don't have a strategy for exiting coal in an orderly manner, but it's quite clear that um, the, the economics will... Uh, and the age of, of our installed capacity that, that uh, over a period of time we will not have uh, coal generation in Australia and unless government subsidises it uh, heavily there won't be new coal generation built. So the consequence of that is, you know, that, that challenge about how, how we transition and, and maintain firming and reliability and uh, Innes would have talked a bit about that as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of commonality and finally, you, you know, you mentioned this question of it's not really about uh, the prices we pay, it's about, um, in, in the context of carbon pricing, what our competitors um, aren't paying, and that of, of that question about carbon leakage has been a great fear in Australia and was uh, one of the reasons why um, the carbon pricing mechanism that I had the pleasure of uh, implementing um, uh, was, was and, and which would have linked with the European system, and we were talking to Europe about doing that, um, so I spent some time on that aspect of it, why, why that um, was, was abolished and uh, hasn't come to pass. So the prospect of an internationally linked uh, carbon pricing, uh, certainly from the Australian perspective, is still pretty far off. And so meanwhile, we have to get on. However, just, I might just, um, in the few minutes we've got left, just kick off a few, few, few questions. And 
Uh, I can't resist the, the question that um, uh, Felix put on the table, which was, um, I'm sure you all heard this phrase resonating, border tax adjustments. And he then said a couple of disparaging things about economists. And I thought, well, the economist to my left might be very keen to weigh into that particular topic. So, so, so could you just talk about that for a second, Ross? Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that uh, the European discussion of border taxes has changed uh, under the cover of the huge uh, war against the rules-based trade system that's being waged by the President of the United States, and uh, that, that allows things to be raised that uh, mm -hmm. uh, w w w were not polite to raise uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in other circumstances. But g given my background, I, uh, I've got more scars on me than from Australia's movement to free trade than I've got from climate change. Mm. And uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so, so that as I did my work for the state governments and the federal government on, on uh, uh, climate and energy, which became the Clean Energy uh, uh, Futures Package in, legislated in uh, t 2011, I put a lot of attention on how we can do these things without making a mess of the of free trade, of the open trading system, which has been so important to our prosperity. Uh, uh, the last European Director General of the WTO, uh, Pascal Lamy, uh, uh, visited me while I was doing that work to discuss these things. He invited me back to Geneva uh, um, just to discuss these things. And uh, I think I got it right in my re report, box 14.5 of uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, of my 2008 uh, re re review. Uh, uh, what we had in our carbon uh, uh, pricing scheme uh, was a, a simplified version of that, not the elegant uh, full solution that, that, that I recommended, but it was a fully satisfactory one and we can say with certainty that the Australian carbon pricing system that existed from the middle of 2012 to the middle of 2014 did not do the tiniest bit of damage to any trade exposed industry. It very carefully worked out and protected. So uh, now, uh, the, fact, uh, the, 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 the fact that people didn't understand that was used politically, and uh, Chloe's quite right that that became one of the issues in the international discussion. But, uh, but I, I think the situation we're in now in, in the world, in Australia, in, in Europe, is that it's uh, not realistic to see uh, 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 major countries, major parts of the world, Germany, Europe, uh, uh, going uh, ahead of the rest of the world on uh, uh, reducing uh, emissions. Uh, without uh, the competitiveness of trade exposed industries being carefully uh, uh, protected. Uh, the, the, the border tax adjustment, uh, if done crudely, just becomes an instrument of protectionism. Uh, th there are ways of doing it that would not simply be protectionism and I think it's very important that Australia works with the European Union, perhaps in the context of the discussions of the free trade agreement, uh, to, to work out things that, that are economically uh, efficient and compatible with, uh, uh, with not discouraging maximum effort on reduction of emissions. Yeah, yeah, I know you're itching to respond, just one sentence, because there are other topics yeah. that we might move on no, to, but please. I, I put this on the slide because I think this is important from two dimensions. The first dimension is dealing with the carbon leakage. We can do, and, and we all know it is, a, the, the, the roots of this idea is somewhere between the textbook, the Trump, Macron, again. But uh, it is not only about carbon leakage. What the border tax adjustment debate tables is the debate on greening the value chains. And I think this is an important point. And I, I just came from Chile, where they have all the copper and all the lithium, and they have realized very precisely that the border tax adjustments are pushing for greening the value chains. Yeah. And I think this is an important point which goes beyond Europe. And, and I think, therefore, this is so important. I don't know if this will, be, if it will come but it became a realistic option, and this has a fallout which goes beyond the carbon leakage. Yeah. Yes, well, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry, 
No, no, no. Yeah, so now we're probably fixating on the border adjustment tax. But from an industry perspective, of course, a country uh, high exporter as Germany, so uh, border adjustment taxes and everything which smells like protectionism and, and cutting off free trade is, of course, of horror. Uh, on the other hand, um, I see the discussion more as an indication that um, the European Commission is starting to admit that this ambition level is going to bring about more inequalities in competition and more problems. Uh, normally, all of this should be solved by the Paris Agreement. So we have uh, Article 6, uh, cooperative approaches and so on. But I think it's, it's more a sign that, um, that the belief that the Paris Agreement is really going the way it should go is, is shrinking in the European Commission. Um, we could think of offsetting as another measure to equalize this, uh, but this discussion is going to be led in the European Commission and they're not going to establish border, uh, border adjustment taxes right now, but the discussion is important, how we can deal with these inequalities and, and frictions. Well, well, thank you. I do think that was, and it's always great to have a little bit of a debate, so I, I think that's a very useful discussion. There were a heap of other points um, that we could have picked up on. We've got scarcely a minute, but I might just op open to the floor, see if anyone has a burning question for our panel. I can think of millions. And uh, so, of course, Frank, please. I think that in the German government, um, the all-electric vision is not the predominant uh, look anymore. Uh, it's, it's a very easy equation. I said so. 98% uh, are liquid or gas used, especially in, in mobility. Uh, you have, uh, for example, um, steel making and cement making and other things have great possibilities to, to defossilize through hydrogen, but of course, therefore, you, you need a whole lot of hydrogen. And we calculated that we would need for a 95% pass in Germany alone, you would need about 400 terawatt hours import a year of these substances, either fuels or um, hydrogen. And this, and um, Felix Mattes pointed it out extremely good, this cannot be produced in, in Germany alone, so we need all of these possibilities to get hydrogen from some other places, which is not a problem because we are importing gas uh, and oil in large amounts already. So we know, how, so we, we are not energy autark today and we're not gonna be it tomorrow. So this is probably not a change in mindset. Mm, great. Well, um, this is um, a great discussion to have started. I do think it sets us up very well for the uh, the, the sessions we're going to have later in the day, um, because this fo focus on <laughs> uh, the focus on how we make this 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 transformation from the energy sources that we use today to energy sources of the future um, is is just a huge question, and obviously we've got to look across all sectors and just not electricity. So we'll hear a lot about that later in the afternoon. If you have further questions for um, my esteemed co-panelists. Uh, we're moving to a break and I'm sure they'd be happy to have a chat with you. So uh, thank you very much and will you please join me in thanking uh, my colleagues on the panel this morning. Thank you very much and the, for those of you who have been here yesterday who know me, I stand between you and the break. Um, just to come back to one point uh, from Holger Lösch, 400 terawatt hours, have a look at the, our yellow scenario brochures. We have the scenario where we have a roughly 400 terawatt hours modeled from coming from Australia. Um, that might be of interest in that context. Um, I would very much like to thank the speakers for setting the um, vision for the day. Um, as you might remember yesterday, for those of you who were here, we had a little bit of an interactive quiz. 
what are the best collaboration ideas between Australia and Germany. And we looked at the results um, overnight, and I'm happy to reveal you now uh, the ideas that came up with and then the first prize winner. So um, starting here, for example, we had greater knowledge share regarding German inverter technologies and its ability to aid the integration of wind and solar energy. Um, fast rail in Australia with German Siemens probably, fast train or hydrogen powered of course. Develop least cost abatement pathways for high emission regions focused on both abatement and creating emerging low emission industries. German heavy industry processes, um, expertise, and Australia's competitive resource base to combine the two. Planning the transition in and out of large scale renewable um, and batteries in 10, 15, 20 years. More on social dimensions of the large scale infrastructure, um, transmission, large scale renewables. And now comes a very interesting one. Have this Australia-German symposium every year. <laughs> this, this was, however, only the bottom half, so unfortunately the price is not going for that last suggestion. We have more, like German fixes everything and Australia thinks them with the sausage sizzle. <laughs> On the second half, we have jointly developed Paris Agreement consistent zero emission pathways as basis for regional cooperation. Australian-German public dialogue to raise acceptance and understanding on the energy transition. Hydrogen made in Australia for Germany, which as you will see is a very close contender for the first prize. Outsource um, Australian energy policy to Germany. <laughs> Innovative proposals. Australian joins the EU ETS, has seven plus votes as well, and we are now got it, getting to the top. So bilateral open source energy system modeling, Second idea was bring the coal commission concept to Australia to help plan the phase out of coal generators in line with Paris Accords. But note here as well that it's, uh, it has a lot of red comments as well. So there are lots of minus votes as well on it. And the first prize, and now if you made that suggestion um, first and got uh, that first prize, you have to out yourself because we don't know. This, uh, as all the uh, polyph is anonymous, so you have to raise your hand. And, <laughs> First prize goes to green hydrogen. That was actually me. That was you. But on behalf of the BDI Architect delegation who's here and has been discussing this very proposal with Australian counterparts yesterday, so I'll leave the details of the technological implementation to our delegation. <laughs> I'll happily take this. Congratulations. <laughs> Marie. <laughs> Marie Kronberg from the German Embassy here in Australia. Um, thank you very much. Now, in order to enlighten your coffee break, we have um, one more interactive feature now for this break. If you go with your devices to polyf.com climate college, then you are going to see um, this break, which is we just, for the long term vision, we just want to test the feeling in the room where are we going to end up in 2100 with global mean temperatures? Are we going to be at one and a half degrees? Are we going to be at two degrees? Are we going to stay on a reference pathway more towards three or three and a half degrees? We know coral reefs in Australia are not to be saved even under one and a half degrees. Get, if you are visiting Australia now, I hope you brought your snorkeling gear because it's the last few years that you're going to see uh, the coral reefs. However, the question is where are we in 2100? We have the Paris Agreement goals of well below two degrees and one and a half degrees. And now if you go into your devices and if you can make the vote, depending on whether you're a German or an Australian participant, so either on the right or on the left side, that would be terrific. I hope you, um, to welcome you all back here at 10.30 and for the speakers, please be 10 minutes before your session in the speaker room. Thank you very much and enjoy your break.